Um, my name is Laverne Moore. I'm with Connecticut Family Support um, Network. I am. I covered the Southwest region. I covered. Um, New Haven to Greenwich. I am co-hosting with my co-worker, um, Crystal Sacco, um, and she covers the South Central um, region. Um, and I just want to go over. Um, I just want to go over. Oh, it's an echo. Feedback. Yeah. Hold on. Try again. Go ahead, Laverne. Okay, sorry about that. I would like to go over um, just some little housekeeping rules. Um, um, the event is going to be recorded, so feel free to turn off your video if you choose to do that. Um, we are the first presenter. I want to now introduce the first um, presenter, which is Debbie Dorman. She's the executive director of disability rights. And we also have two child advocates, which is Michael Willoughby and Marie Feliciano. Um, at any time, feel free to type in the chat or um, wait till the end and to unmute yourself. Um, they're going to present for about an hour and the last 15 minutes is going to be for Q&A. Right following, right after would be another presenter and it will be the same format. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Laverne. Um, uh, and um, we're going to start out. Hi, everybody. I'm Debbie Dorfman. I'm the executive director from Disability Rights Connecticut. And uh, we really want to thank uh, Laverne and Crystal for having us here today. And um, we're going to start out um, uh, our community uh, engagement advocate, Mike Wilby, is going to start out with the first part of the presentation. And then I'll do the second part of the presentation. And um, also want to introduce you to, um, so I have Mike here, and um, then uh, also introduce you to Maria Feliciano, our child advocate and investigator. Okay. Thank, thank you, Debbie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Wilby. Uh, I'm the Community Engagement Advocate for Disability Rights Connecticut. And so um, I'm going to start off with a uh, overview of um, Disability Rights Connecticut. Okay. Um, part of that overview um, will be, we'll deal with uh, uh, introduction to uh, Disability Rights Connecticut. Um, our children and youth with disability, juvenile justice, legal issues and rights in the community, uh, children and youth with disabilities and the juvenile justice system, risk factors and disparities, um, avoiding entry to the juvenile justice system, the right to medically necessary services for Medicaid eligible uh, youth, and um, common issues for children with disabilities in detention, um, children and youth with disability rights in, in the detention. Okay, a little bit about DRCT. Um, we are a legal advocacy organization. Um, we're dedicated to identifying and eliminating barriers faced by people with disabilities when exercising their civil, legal, and human rights. Um, we are an independent nonprofit organization. Um, we're largely funded by federal entities and authorized by the Developmental Disabilities Assistance and Bill of Rights Act, the Protection and Advocacy for Individuals with Mental Illness Act, um, the Protection and Advocacy for Individual Rights Act and the other Protection and Advocacy System Acts and the respective implementing regulations. Our mission um, is to advocate, educate, investigate, and pursue legal, administrative, and other appropriate remedies to advance and protect the civil rights of individuals with disabilities to participate equally and fully in all facets of community life in Connecticut. Who do we help? DRCT advocates for Connecticut residents with all types of disabilities and of all ages within the mandates and requirements established by federal statutes. DRCT responds to all requests for information and referral regardless of disability but focuses its resources on systemic advocacy 
and therefore provides limited individual ad advocacy to people with disabilities who meet funding mandates and establish priorities. What do we do? We work with, um, inf we do information and referrals. Um, this is the entry point for requesting DRCT services, um, which is often, often talking with a DRCT staff person assigned to provide information and referral services. Depending on the need presented, staff may provide information, connect callers to appropriate advocacy or legal team staff, or make referrals to relevant outside agencies. We also monitor and investigate facilities. Um, DRCT has the authority to investigate reports of abuse and neglect, where it, was, where it has probable cause to believe that persons with disabilities have been abused or neglected. Congress gave PNAs extensive access authority to protect people with disabilities and to ensure effective abuse and neglect investigations. We do not duplicate the services of other state mandated protective services, but may conduct a secondary investigation if warranted. We also do individual representation. Um, ad advocacy or legal representation may be available if the complaint or concern falls within DRCT's designated focus areas and objectives, which are set each year with approval from the board of directors. We also deal with systemic advocacy, where DRCT focuses its limited resources on systemic issues affecting large numbers of people with disabilities Particular attention is paid to members of unserved or undeserved groups, especially from ethnic or racial minorities or geographical regions, such as our rural and urban areas. As such, um, we also deal with community engagement. Um, DRCT, DRCT works with individuals with disabilities, their families and community partners to understand common goals priorities and visions. Um, DRCT, DRCT staff provides outreach and training to establish and maintain community relationships and implement strategies that promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. We also provide training upon request on issues related to our focus areas. Um, our four focus areas are education, abuse and neglect, community living, and employment. If you believe you or a group you're a member of could benefit from the training, you can submit requests for training and outreach to the RCT. Issues, areas that we don't cover, um, some of those are bankruptcy, uh, criminal and family law, uh, financial assistance, which includes direct cash, utility, phone or other bills, uh, rental or mortgage assistance, property tax, identity theft, eviction, malpractice, mortgage foreclosures, um, obtaining guardianship, personal injury, property law, social security disability determination, and wills. So, um, so at this time, I'd like to turn things over to, uh, to Debbie, our executive uh, director. Um, we'll be able to uh, go through um, some more of our um, of our issues. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, and uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining. Um, for those of you who joined a little bit later, I'm Debbie Dorf, and I'm the executive director for DRCT. And um, we're now going to um, move to the part of the presentation that really focuses on um, the uh, juvenile justice issues um, and we're our part of the presentation really won't focus on education too much because I know that the next presenter is really focusing on that. Um, I, there will be a little bit of overlap just because there's necessarily a, a relationship between the juvenile justice system and school unfortunately. Um, so you know there will be a little overlap but we mostly won't 
be talking about that. The other thing I wanted to let you know is uh, a couple of other things. One is that in talking about these issues as it relates to the juvenile justice system, we aren't going to be talking about criminal law because we don't practice, as, as Mike just mentioned, we don't handle criminal law matters. So what we're going to be talking about are really um, around um, the issues uh, that really often come up and the rights of children with disabilities in the juvenile justice system as it relates to their disability and not necessarily, uh, not related to like criminal defense kinds of things. Um, because that's just not our area of practice. Also just wanna say that the information that we're providing today um, is not legal advice about a particular legal matter um, and shouldn't be considered uh, any legal advice. If you need legal advice, it's really important to um, contact an attorney and we have some resources that we'll go over at the end um, uh, to talk about the specific issue um, confidentially. But again, this is not legal advice. This is just to give you some information and we'll have some time as Laverne pointed out um, at the end to try to answer your questions. And also, um, although I'm doing this part of the presentation, I wanna just note um, and introduce you to Maria Feliciano, who is our um, a, a child advocate and also investigator, um, Maria, um, does investigations of alleged abuse neglect and neglect of children in facilities. So if um, we get complaints or we believe that uh, there's a child or a group of children being abused or neglected in a juvenile, just, uh, juvenile detention facility or psychiatric facility or any type of facility or even in the community, um, then uh, Maria, um, you know, we have the authority to investigate as long as the you know, the person has a disability and um, our focus is facilities. Um, so she does that. And also she does provide uh, individual advocacy and also um, will be working on systemic advocacy with us to hopefully improve um, the lives of, of kids um, with disabilities who are in the juvenile justice system at school and in the community. So with that, um, and I guess Maria, I saw you on, do you just wanna say hi for a second? Is that all right? I don't know if, it, if, it, if she may be. Oh, we can't hear you, Maria? Uh oh. She's unmuted. Yeah, I don't. Um, sorry, Maria, we can't hear you, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, well, she's waving. <laughs> So she says hi to everybody. Um, sorry about that. Sorry, Maria. Um, so now we'll go ahead and get started um, and talking about the issues. And I thought um, it would be important, and I know um, Laverne and Crystal were um, interested in talking about um, the you know, uh, issues around. I mean, if we could just go back to the slide before, Mike, the one about racial, um, I'm sorry, about risk factors. Thanks. Um, so um, to talk about the risk factors and then talk about racial disparities in the juvenile justice system before we start talking about specific issues and, um, and rights. So, you know, I have listed here on the screen just a few of the risk factors. There's actually, when you look at the studies that people have done, there's a whole a whole host of them, but these are one the ones that we have here listed, um, and I'll just go over them, um, are ones that um, one sees often in the various studies that have been done. And a, a really top risk factor is trauma. And um, as you can imagine, when, when kids have traumatic events in their lives, um, that can manifest itself in, in many different ways, especially um, when kids have disabilities and they may not be able to um, necessarily um, report experiences that they've had in a way that can get them help right away or, and, um, or um, in even um, the trauma itself can cause mental health disabilities to, to develop. So, and that trauma can come from, um, situations involving domestic violence. It can come from bullying at school. It can come from other 
um, from abuse or neglect that happens um, in the community or in, in a facility, for example. So there's a whole wide range of, of different ways in which trauma can um, uh, result. And um, then the trauma, if can also, um, not only can it cause the, the you know, um, mental health disabilities to develop, but it can also cause um, situations where kids who already have mental health or behavioral health conditions can exacerbate those problems. Um, and sometimes that contributes to behavioral problems that then lead to children being arrested um, either in the community or at school. Um, so that's, that's one um, significant risk factor. Also, um, another uh, important risk factor is disability, particularly kids who have behavioral health conditions um, and or cognitive disabilities. Oftentimes um, what can happen is because of their disabilities, they may not um, understand rules and may break rules and, and not realize that they're breaking the rules and um, or do some behavior that gets them involved in the criminal justice system. And unfortunately, we see this a lot at school um, where kids um, have uh, behavioral problems. And because of um, very, very strict school rules that often um, are not very tolerant of um, behavior. I'm, I mean, literally I've had cases where kids have, because of their disabilities have been running around in the hallways screaming because of the disability and literally been arrested for that. Um, and, or if a child's having a mental health um, crisis and then, um, you know, somebody puts their hands on the child to try to calm the child down. I've had cases where the child might push back with their arms, you know, even a little kid. And then that's taken as, um, you know, an assault on a school employee or a police officer, and then the child gets arrested. So unfortunately, and I know that you'll have a speaker that's talking about um, these kinds of things in schools, but it is important just to raise because that is a, unfortunately a big feeder to the juvenile justice system and how kids get, there's a lot of school-based arrests for what I would say is really either school-based behavior, um, which should be dealt with by you know, in that context, not by police, um, or um, because of disabilities, like because of behavioral problems that kids are having um, and really need mental health supports instead, or other, some other sort of behavioral health support. Um, and another risk factor is the lack of adequate educational services. And again, this is another area of overlap, but when um, kids, are not getting the services they need because um, maybe they aren't, they're in special education, they're not the special education uh, services that they're getting are not appropriate, are not what, you know, they're not getting everything they need. Maybe they're um, not getting reasonable accommodations or modifications that they need. Um, and then as a result, there are behavioral problems and the next thing you know, kids are being suspended or expelled from school. And um, so that also can be an important risk factor con to consider. And I'm sure as the next speaker will probably tell you that you know, the highest rates of, um, of school discipline, including school-based arrests and, um, uh, and suspensions and expulsions, this, you know, this is true throughout the United States. Um, there are you know, very, very significant disparities. Um, so it's disproportionately kids of color who have disabilities. Those are the, the kids who get arrested the most. Um, so not surprisingly, these end up being risk factors to getting into the juvenile justice system. Um, gender is also an issue. Um, more often than not, um, the kids who end up in the juvenile justice system are male, um, but not, you know, I mean, not always. Um, and uh, uh, female children also do get arrested, um, oftentimes on different types of charges. Um, also poverty and homelessness also have a direct tie as well. So I mean, there, as I mentioned, there are a number of other factors that different studies have found um, to lead to um, kids entering the system. But these are some, I just wanted to highlight these um, for now. Um, Mike, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Another thing that I know uh, that we wanted to talk about today and really relates to um, the disproportionality of 
um, that I just mentioned earlier about kids of color who have disabilities entering into the juvenile justice system are the huge racial and ethnic disparities. And if you just look, and this is this is not just a problem in Connecticut. You know, I've worked all over the United States dealing with these issues. And I can say that it's everywhere that I've gone. I've worked in uh, Washington State, California, um, and um, also uh, in Massachusetts. So, and, and, you know, met with people who are working around the country. And really this is a big problem. And I know that in Connecticut, it's a big problem too. Um, if you look at the data, and, from Connecticut, there's actually a, a recent study done by the Urban Institute and the, um, the citations at the bottom um, of the page. And um, there's a link to, to it if you're interested. But basically the study found, um, and this is a 2020 study, so fairly recently, that in Connecticut, that although the overall admission of kids to pre-adjudication detention. And what that means is before there's been a determination of whether the, you know, the child is delinquent or not, um, that the overall admission to facilities and to detention facilities has overall declined, but the proportion of the admissions that are going on are disproportionately um, much higher for children of youth um, who, um, are of color. And so that's a really important piece to know um, because it shows that while maybe Connecticut's doing better um, in terms of looking for alternatives to, to detention, um, uh, we're not doing very well in terms of kids of color. And um, when you also kind of layer onto that, it, you, the intersectionality of kids with disabilities, again, we see that those are the kids that end up in detention. Um, and um, I have some data here that came from the report, but basically um, of the kids who are in detention, 84% are kids of color um, and um, only 16% are those who are white. So um, you can really, I think that really shows you the disparity and um, we're not going in the right direction with that. So that is something that we need to work on and um, get kids um, back into the community and not have them go into detention. So um, I wanted to now, um, do you mind uh, moving to the next slide? Thank you. Before we get into a discussion um, about issues in detention, I thought it would be helpful to tell you a little bit about um, one legal right that's really important for people to know about that can really help to avoid, um, for kids who have disabilities, can really be an important um, piece of information to have to really try to avoid kids ending up in the juvenile justice system. Sure. And that is um, the, uh, what's called the Early and Periodic Screening Diagnosis and Treatment Program, sure. which is, uh, called the EPSDT uh, program. And that's a Medicaid program which is for kids who, for um, basically all kids who are Medicaid eligible up until the age of 21. Um, it re it, it's a, a federal law that requires that the state provide all medically necessary services to kids who, um, including mental health services up until the age of 21. So if you have Medicaid, your child has Medicaid, then they are entitled to get all medically necessary services. And why this is important, it's not just when we talk about medically necessary services, it's not just like medical services like, um, you know, uh, treatment for the, you know, if a child gets uh, the chicken pox or flu or medical conditions, which is very, very important. Um, and so I don't wanna minimize that, but also I just wanna make sure that everyone understands that it also includes mental health services. And that's really important because sometimes um, it's, it's hard to find the mental health services. Sometimes there's long wait times for that um, and people don't know where to go. And so it's important to know that this is a legal right. This is an entitlement. And these days there's not a lot of legal entitlements, but this is one. Um, and so for kids who have Medicaid, and sometimes in uh, Connecticut, I think it's referred to as health track uh, or Husky um, health, but um, you may have heard of those terms, but this is really important. And what that means is not just the actual treatment, but the screening and evaluations to find out what um, the child needs. 
um, diagnostic services, so diagnosing the child so that the child can get the right treatment. And um, so this is really, um, really important. Um, also, um, there is a service um, called RAP Connecticut, um, which are wraparound services, which can even um, bring um, home-based mental health, mental and behavioral health services into the home so um, that kids can stay at home and not have to be removed from their homes to go to a facility to get mental health treatment. And kids should not have to find themselves in juvenile detention as a way to get um, mental health services. They should be able to get services in the community so we can avoid um, kids going to the juvenile justice system. And so, you know, um, this is an area um, which, you know, we'll talk about in, in a little bit, but, um, you know, if there are problems having, getting access to these home-based services, um, this would be, you know, something that you might want to call Disability Rights Connecticut to talk about. Um, and Maria put in the chat, and thank you, Maria, um, that uh, she confirmed that it's also known as Husky Health. So um, thanks, Maria. And um, she's put some a little bit of information in the chat. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So now um, I'll just come back to uh, talking about kids who end up in juvenile detention, because unfortunately, um, you know, we were talking earlier about how um, kids, uh, there's been an overall decline in uh, uh, admitting kids into at least pre-adjudication detention, but nevertheless, kids end up in detention. And so when they get there, um, kids with disabilities tend to um, have, I mean, well, all kids who end up in detention um, can encounter all kinds of problems. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I wanted to highlight some issues that I know are uh, particularly um, you know, ones that show up for kids with disabilities. Um, so one of the problems can be is that when kids with disabilities go to detention, um, sometimes the staff and um, even with all good intentions, sometimes don't adequately identify their disabilities. And this can um, be particularly true uh, for kids who have mental health disabilities or um, also particularly difficult for kids who have intellectual or developmental disabilities. And the reason for that is because a lot of times the staff haven't been provided with the training that they need to do that. Um, and or um, there uh, sometimes a situation where there's not the right screening tools, especially for kids with intellectual disabilities, because there's very specific screening tools to, um, that need to be used to identify those kids and those are not the same as mental health screening tools. They're very, they're quite different actually. And um, so it, it is not, um, it, it's a common problem around the United States. And so I wanted to raise that. Um, also another problem can be that with kids with disabilities that affect their ability to communicate, um, this could be, you know, um, a, there could be a child who is deaf or hard of hearing. There may be a child who, because of their, um, their uh, mental health disabilities or uh, may they may have intellectual disabilities and as a result have difficulty communicating. So that can be a big problem. Um, can also be a problem if they're not provided with other accommodations and modifications that they need to understand things. So um, a really, good example of that and you know it's mentioned down below is the disciplinary problems regarding disability but a very common problem is um, when there are a lot of rules in juvenile detention but if you don't understand what is being told to you because of your disability there's it's chances are you probably can't follow the rules and um, even if you can understand and hear the rules that may not necessarily make sense or the child may need support to help follow those rules. And unfortunately, without the right, um, if kids haven't been identified as having the disabilities that they do, and if they haven't been provided with effective communications and accommodations, then chances are they're probably not going to be able to follow the rules, and then they get punished. And that, in turn, ends up delaying their ability to uh, be discharged from the facility or, uh, you know, 
finding a placement that will accept them because the more that they get in trouble and the longer they stay, um, you know, the more um, any sort of uh, information that goes out to uh, individuals in the community to maybe place them in the community, um, the, the, the profile of the kid ends up looking more and more negative and it's just harder and harder to, to get out from underneath that. And the same thing happens at school. Um, because a lot of times schools will say, oh no, this child's too difficult. They behaved badly in, um, in detention. We don't want them. And then they end up in segregated schools um, for kids with disabilities rather than being integrated into uh, their neighborhood schools. And so this could have, the these are really important issues to really um, think about when kids end up in, in um, detention and really try to deal with them early on. Um, and um, also other things that can happen is when kids are not identified properly, um, if they need mental health or medical care, sometimes there are delays in getting that or may not have the adequate care that they need. Um, and for kids with intellectual disabilities, they may not get the habilitative active treatment that they need. And as a result of that, the skills that they have, they may lose skills and um, that um, will make it also, um, that's very harmful to the child and <clears throat> will uh, put the child behind in their progression in, um, in um, being able to uh, be independent in the community, but also make it harder for um, kids to be discharged back into the community and also re-enter into school. So these are common issues. You, you may be familiar with these issues, but um, if, if kids, if uh, your kids are having these problems, again, these may be issues you may want to call Disability Rights Connecticut to discuss. Um, so now we'll move on to talking about some rights because I talked a lot about issues um, but what are some rights? And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on special education because I know your next speaker will do that. But I do wanna just note that even when kids are in detention, they have rights to education. And that's really important. Um, and so for children who are, um, whether they have disabilities or not, um, they have rights to have access to education. For kids with disabilities, they have um, the right to, um, if they need reasonable uh, modifications or accommodations in order to participate in uh, their education in uh, detention, then they have a right to get those reasonable modifications and accommodations. And I'm gonna explain that process in, in just a minute. But um, also kids who are in special education, um, who uh, either, were in special education in the community or needs uh, uh, special education, but has not been in special education, but gets identified as um, needing special education while they're in detention, they do have a right to receive that up until their 22nd birthday, unless um, they've already graduated or received a GED. Um, and that is required by federal law. Um, additionally, it's important to know that kids who are in detention do have a right to minimally adequate health and mental health treatment. Um, and they also have a right to be free from abuse and neglect. Um, if, um, again, if you have a child with a disability who is in detention and um, there are problems um, in terms of not getting the education they need or the uh, mental health or healthcare or they're being abused or neglected, again, um, that those are issues that you can contact Disability Rights Connecticut about. Okay, so um, <clears throat> now I just wanna um, talk also about the right to be free from disability discrimination. Um, it's really important to know that um, in addition to the other things that we just discussed that um, children have rights just like adults um, who, so adults who end up in in, whether they're adults with disabilities, whether in they're in the community or if they're in jail or prison, they have rights to be um, free from disability discrimination and so do kids. Um, we have some federal laws. One is called the Americans with Disabilities Act um, and the other is called Section 504 of uh, the uh, Rehabilitation Act of 1973. 
And under those federal laws, um, children with disabilities, um, well, people with disabilities, including youth who are in detention have a variety of legal rights. And, and so some of the important rights that they have under these statutes, and we also have a, a similar Connecticut state law as well, um, but the right to have what we call effective communications. And that means that they have communications that um, are um, the type of communications that um, will work for them. And um, so there's some modifications that the facility, that people in the facility um, have to provide to the kids so that they can um, actually participate in the programs and, and activities and services of of the um, detention center. And so, you know, we talked a little bit about um, disciplinary policies, for example, and, um, and that kind of thing. So part of having effective communication is being able to convey rules to kids with disabilities in a way that they can understand them. Um, and that's gonna be individualized and that sort of thing. Um, also, there are, is a right to have reasonable modifications to participate in the programs and um, services and activities. So there may be um, some, uh, let's say that there is um, uh, an art program that the detention center has or some other program. And um, the, you know, there may be need, they may need to modify the policies so that, or the programs or services so that the kids with disabilities can participate. And what you don't wanna have is two separate programs so that uh, kids with disabilities end up getting segregated off into a program just because they have disabilities. Because under, under the Americans with Disabilities Act and under section 504, um, there's also um, a prohibition of um, unnecessary segregation of, of kids with disabilities. So if, um, if segregation isn't necessary, for example, if a child could benefit and handle being integrated, um, even like, for example, in a living situation within the detention facility, um, then they should be integrated and participating with their peers who do not have disabilities. Um, and that's the same is true in school um, and also in programs in the community. So those are just some examples of uh, the right to be free from disability discrimination. Um, Mike, next slide, please. So um, I wanted, and I know that I wanna leave some time to answer some questions, so I'll try to hurry up here. Um, but um, I wanted to just give you some advocacy tips about how, um, if a child needs a reasonable accommodation or modification um, while in detention, and this is actually true, uh, whether even in the community, if you're talking about needing um, accommodation or modifications at school or um, another you know, entity that is um, required to provide um, reasonable accommodations and modifications. Uh, this is particularly focused on detention right now, but um, the, is to, first of all, you, you have to make a request um, for the accommodation. It's probably what I would advise is that everybody try to do it in writing if possible. You can do it verbally, but um, it's really important to try to do it in writing. Um, and the reason for that is that if you do it in writing, then you have a copy of it. You have a record of what you've asked for. And that's really important so that later somebody can say, well, you never asked for that. Um, and then you know, there's no fight over, yes, you did, or no, you didn't. Um, the other thing is to sign and date the request and keep a copy. Um, and, that if, um, and, and that's really important because again, you don't wanna get into a dispute of whether you uh, made the request, when you made the request and what you asked for. Um, if there's medical documentation or other documentation to support the request, that's always helpful. It's not required. Um, and, but another thing that is really also helpful is that when you're asking for the accommodation, um, that the accommodation has to have a relationship to the disability. So there has to be, um, what we would call a nexus. So that there has to, it has to make sense, like why the requested accommodation, um, why it's being requested and, um, why it would be needed 
based on the disability. So there just has to be a relationship there. But again, you don't have to have the medical documentation and, and you actually don't have to put it in writing if, if that's not possible. But if you can, that would be helpful. Um, if you don't quite know how to request the accommodations, that's also something that um, you could speak to. Um, uh, for example, if you have um, a medical provider and ask for help with that or um, a case manager, or if um, you need information about how to do that, also contacting Disability Rights Connecticut is another good way to find out how to do that. Um, if um, if when a request for an accommodation is made, then um, the, um, the person to whom the request is being made has to respond. They can't just blow it off. They have to, there is a legal requirement to respond. And um, if there, if, for example, let's say that a request for a child for an accommodation is made in detention and that request is denied, um, it has to be in writing why, the, why it was denied and, and the, it needs to be provided to you in writing. And then what needs to happen is that they, it doesn't just stop there. They need to really sit down with um, you and f have what we call the interactive process to see if another uh, reasonable alternative um, accommodation can um, be reached to, um, that would work for both parties. Um, so there and that has to be done in good faith. And it's really important um, that both parties sit down. So the detention officials need to do that, but so do parents and, and the child. Um, and uh, especially if the child's an older child, the child should definitely be participating in that. Um, so that's how to uh, ask for an accommodation. If, um, if your child's rights have been violated, um, if the conditions of care in the facility are poor or there's a not been um, the ability to um, get an accommodation, then it's very, very important to use the grievance procedure. And unfortunately, the rules around the grievance procedure are very strict and um, you have to follow the rules. And a lot of times um, the, um, the child themselves will have to actually file the, the grievance. It, um, a lot of times, um, in the, it's important to look, most detention facilities will have a handbook. So be sure to read the handbook, uh, ask for a copy of the handbook and read, read that, make sure your child has a copy of it. Um, and if a grievance needs to be filed, follow the directions in the handbook. That's really, really important. And I'll tell you why in just a second. But um, the, and unfortunately, most grievance procedures require the child to actually file it, which makes it really hard, especially when you have a little child who, um, or even an older child who may have an intellectual disability or mental health disability and not really reasonably be able to do it. Unfortunately, later on, um, if you want to take legal action, um, one, of the, one of the barriers to that is if, if uh, somebody else files the grievance on behalf of the kid, then that um, will be not be considered as the proper um, uh, process. So there are ways to help a child, however. So for example, you can help write it for the child and then have the child can sign it. And then you can instruct the child like, okay, go, go give it to, you know, whoever it is that you're supposed to give it to in detention. Or sometimes there's a box that you drop it in. Again, the handbook will explain it but um, the actual filing of the grievance needs to happen by the child. And I'm um, sorry to say that, but um, unless there's some exception in the handbook, um, that's really important. Um, and um, why don't we, um, there's, uh, you can um, file with the, uh, with the detention superintendent or with the deputy director of the ju uh, juvenile residential services at court support services. Um, and let's go to the next slide because I know we're gonna run out of time. I see that there's a few questions. Um, the reason why the grievance procedure is so very strict is because um, there's something called the prison reform, uh, 
the Prison Litigation Reform Act. It's the PLRA for short. And it's a federal law that was passed in the mid nineties to try to prevent prisoners and um, detainees from bringing prison litigation. Unfortunately, since the mid nineties, um, the courts have interpreted this, uh, these restrictions uh, very broadly and applied this law even to juvenile facilities um, and even to kids. So um, you would, think that they wouldn't do that, but they do, um, unfortunately. And so what one of the big features of this federal law is that in, before someone can file a lawsuit in federal court about the conditions of care or a failure to provide a reasonable accommodation or modification in violation of discrim uh, disability discrimination um, laws, uh, you have to exhaust all of your administrative remedies. Um, so if you're, and that applies to all prisoners. And um, so the prisoner needs to, um, uh, and it, in this case, it, the, uh, the child who's in detention needs to file and go through all of the steps of, of the, um, uh, of the, um, administrative process that's in the handbook. So again, follow the handbook. It's so important to get the handbook because each facility is different and each state um, has different rules around that. Um, and um, as, a, uh, you know, I have a few advocacy tips, which is that um, again, having the child do it, you can help fill out the form for the child and just make sure that the, you know, the child then gives it to the right person. Um, make sure to uh, go through all levels of the grievance system until they are exhausted. Sometimes when you submit a grievance, nobody responds. And if that happens, just keep going through the process. So if the first level, the child files the grievance, nobody responds, go to the second level. Once the time frame has, um, has elapsed, just keep going and make sure you go through all of them. That's really important. Um, and um, also if there's a, a, an official form that the juvenile hall asks you to use or juvenile detention facility, use that form. Um, that's gonna be really important. Um, don't just use any piece of paper, try to use the form. If you're having problems getting the form, um, then you should request the form from uh, the detention facility directly and they should give you a copy of that form. and. Um, uh, if um, also, if you are feeling like your, your child's rights have been violated, it's really important to consult a lawyer um, about what your rights are and what, you, what your child's rights are um, and their individual situations. Um, so um, you can also, um, another thing I wanted to let you know that you can do is um, if you feel that uh, your child's rights have been violated, um, you can file a, com a complaint, um, an American uh, civil rights complaint or an ADA complaint with the United States Department of Justice. Um, and um, I have some information on the next page about that, but um, they in, um, there's no guarantee that they will investigate your complaint or what they will do, but um, this is one thing that you could do. Um, and um, they look at, often will look at conditions of care lack of uh, the use of excessive force, lack of medical or mental health treatment and discrimination. Um, and it's not just disability discrimination. They also look at racial and ethnic discrimination as well. Um, and um, here's an, some information. If you do wanna file a complaint with the United States Department of Justice, you can um, either send it a, a written complaint by mail, you can fax it and here's the fax number, or by email. And um, there's uh, this little link here. Um, if you go to that link, it takes you to the complaint form online and you can just fill it out online. Um, the one thing that with the ADA or civil rights complaints that you can file with DOJ, the child doesn't need to do that. You could do that, anybody can do that. So um, you don't need the child to be doing that. So that is uh, one good thing about that um, among other things. So um, the next are just uh, some resources. Um, I have uh, our contact information. Um, you know, 
I would say this, that, um, you know, DRCT um, is really moving more to systemic reform work. And so um, we're trying, the reason is because we're a small agency and we want to maximize our resources and be able to help as many kids as and many people with disabilities as possible. But, um, you know, if, um, if you do have questions, if you do, um, if there are situations where there's abuse and neglect um, or rights violations, um, you can still call us and we make an individual determination as the case, you know, as the request for assistance come in. Um, I also I provided the Center for Children's Advocacy phone numbers. They um, do that. That's they do extensive work um, in this area. The Connecticut Justice Alliance, which um, also does extensive work, then the um, AFCAMP also has um, is a great resource, and Favor, which is um, also another great resource, particularly for mental health services. Um, and um, so with that, I know that we just have a few more minutes and I uh, know that there's some questions. So let me look in the chat and see uh, what we have um, in the I can I can read them for you if you'd like. Oh, um, okay. Let me ask you very quickly. Do you um, mind if these slides get sent out to people who might wanna have those resources just available to them in print? Is that all right with you? To sure. Share. I, I, there's a few little typos that I want to fix that I apologize to everybody. I, I noticed them. And so if it would be all right, I would like to fix the typos. I'll send you a new one and then you can send it out. Sure. No Is problem. That okay? that yeah, would be no better. problem. Um, I want to thank you guys. I want to take this time to move on to some questions. Um, and Jen was very nice to say that we could have a little extra time if need be. So we're okay with that. But we have a question from, and it says, what about if they use the excuse that the ch child does not qualify for services? Um, so you mean, uh, let me just clarify, are we talking about special education services? Um, you know what, If uh, it's from Sheila. Ortiz, if you would like to unmute. Shayla. Oh, I'm sorry, Shayla. If you'd like to ask the question, well, go right ahead. Yes. Um, well, usually when their child is receiving certain specific um, services, and you feel like those services are not working, either they have to be catered to trauma, they have to be catered to something else. Um, and, you know, this, they usually do like a quick assessment, and then they're like, oh, they don't qualify for that. So um, you mean in detention or like a school? Detention? Either or, or in all the scenarios. Oh, okay. So, um, well, if you don't agree, um, so for, you know, for example, in the school context, and I know you're going to have a speaker who, who's going to be talking about school, um, but, uh, you know, in the school context, if, a, if the school has made an assessment and determined that, let's say, you think that your child uh, should qualify for special education and, uh, the school doesn't agree or the school district that is providing the service in the in detention doesn't agree, then you can ask for an independent assessment. And, um, you know, usually um, those assessments are free um, that the school district usually has to pay for those. Um, if, um, you know, uh, if the um, parent doesn't have the financial resources to do that. And so basically, the, usually, and I, you know, um, I have to say I'm new to Connecticut, so I've only been working in this position for about three and a half months or so. Um, but just generally, from my experience around the country, usually kids who qualify for free lunch, um, you know, um, then uh, in those situations, usually the district then has the obligation to pay for um, for the independent assessment. So that is something that you can do. If you have, um, you know, uh, for example, if there's um, like for mental health services and let's say they do an evaluation and they say, well, no, the child doesn't qualify for mental health services or um, for any, you know, uh, if you have a child with autism and they say, no, you know, they don't qualify. What you can do is, um, you know, through the, I was talking about the EPSDT, your rights under EPSDT for, um, for Medicaid eligible kids. So if you're, uh, you know, your child is Medicaid eligible, then what you can do is um, see whether or not you can get um, an assessment. What I would say is make sure that you get an, uh, ask for an assessment to be done by somebody who has been deemed like a qualified 
um, person to do a mental health assessment. If you have a child with autism, um, having somebody who's qualified to do an assessment from that. But um, Medicaid should pay for those um, assessments if they're medically necessary. And um, so that may be a way to do that. Um, there are often times um, opportunities to have um, if services are denied and you, um, after you get an independent assessment and you're still getting denied, there are oftentimes opportunities to have um, a, a fair hearing in certain situations. Um, so, um, uh, you know, you could ask for, um, like, for example, in the school context, if, if you, after you had an independent assessment and there's still disagreement, you could have mediation, you could ask for a fair hearing, um, oftentimes referred to as a due process hearing. Um, you could file a state uh, uh, special education complaint. Uh, so there are a variety of different things that you could do. If you have private insurance um, and you can get um, an assessment covered by private insurance, you can also do that. So I hope that helps to answer the question. Thank you. Maria, do you still, you still can't unmute? Is it, it's still not working. Maria mentions that the Hartford and Bridgeport detention centers have classified detention officers that can provide accommodations for each child to file a grievance. Okay, mm -hmm. so we have, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just thanking Maria for that. Okay. Can you guys um, hear me now? Oh, yep, yeah, go ahead. Yes, so each, I'm sorry, my voice is hoarse, but each, um, well, there's only two detention um, centers open, the Hartford and the Bridgeport. But the CDOs have, um, you know, some social work background, most of them. So whenever there's a child with a disability, they can assist them in assuring and providing those accommodations so that they can um, submit a grievance. And there is boxes that um, Debbie mentioned. They're locked where only administrative staff can go in and, and grab those grievances. Thank you. Um, Pat, do you want to unmute and ask your questions? I know you have a few of them. You see, see me? You're not, I can't hear you. Sorry. You <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking away. Um, I think Maria answered at least one of them um, about the lawsuits against facilities because it seems like it's discrimination to take a child who has a disability and make them file their own grievances. Um, so that was one of my questions, whether there had been lawsuits about that, um, either around the country or, or in the state. Um, my other question, oh, my other question was, and I apologize if I missed this earlier, if a child already qualifies for special education in their home school and goes to a detention facility, does that IEP transfer? So it should, yes. Um, and um, I, you know, can uh, defer to the next speaker about IEPs, but um, the answer is that it should. Um, and so basically it's just like if a kid were going to another school district, they left their district and moved, the IEP would go with them. So the IEP should go with them to detention. Um, it, it, in my experience, and again, you know, I'm new to Connecticut, so I really can't say what specifically goes on in Connecticut, but I can say from you know a national perspective and the work that I've done, which is extensive in this area is that even though kids should be bringing the, the IEP with them, um, sometimes it takes a while for detention um, folks to start implementing that and um, holding the IEP. So if there are delays, then it's important for parents to follow up of, you know, and take affirmative steps to try to follow up and make sure that um, this that the detention actually got the IEP, um, and you know that they know um, it's really really important um, because they, you know, there could be a delay from the school district. There could just be a delay within detention. Sometimes in detention, you have a school district that actually is providing the services. Um, and so it, it depends on how it works, but the main thing is that the answer is yes, it should transfer. Okay. Thank you. That was another question about who provides the services, uh, who pays for the services and how they're provided. But um, I had a follow-up, but I think you answered it. 
Okay, I think Trisha, I'm I wanted to just to clarify that I was not giving legal advice. What I was saying, because um, I think your question was part, um, you know, kind of like a legal question about lawsuits and discrimination. What I was um, saying is that whenever a child, you know, we want children with disabilities to be included, you know, just like if there was a child with no disability and they were in detention and they needed to file a grievance, a child with a disability should have the same process. So sometimes even children without disabilities need the support to file a grievance. So the CP, the CDOs kind of like, for lack of a better word, I'm saying like clinical, like, you know, they have that social work, most of them that background to support, you know, it's like a case management where they right. work and provide that information to a child that wouldn't normally know about accommodations. And something that Debbie um, mentioned earlier is that every agency has policies, resident manuals, you know, of uh, to refer to. So that's why we always encourage whenever, you know, families have a child in there, even if the fam the mother cannot um, write the grievance, the mother can always, or the father, or the caregiver, foster parent, um, in inform the CDO that the child, you know, needs some type of support and to meet with the child to help them facilitate, you know, that process, if that makes sense. But maybe Debbie, you can um, provide her the information regarding um, the legal piece. Yeah, yeah. no, I, under I understand, thank you. That explains a lot. I was, it wasn't really a legal question. I was kind of just asking if, um, if there was something, anything going on in the state that might be um, addressing that. Um, if you knew of anything from disability rights or something, or yeah. the state as a disability type of thing um, in general. Um, yeah, so- it, uh, Especially if each facility has its own process um, in, in addressing disabilities, that seems um, against ADA, which is a federal law. So it seems like it should be covered under a under ADA or something, I don't know. I, I, that was just, it, it wasn't really a legal question, it's just a curious question. Yeah. So, so what, for um, entities like juvenile detention would be covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. However, um, so kids are, you know, if they need reasonable modifications so that they can have, uh, you know, have um, equal opportunities to participate in the activities and programs and services, then you know those accommodations need to be made, um, and um, but when there is when a child is not happy with the conditions of care or where they're not getting accommodations, um, then um, then going through the grievance process is what needs to happen and you have to read the rules for each facility and again you know I don't I haven't read the rules for the facilities here so I can't speak to specifics um, I did you know have a when I was in California um, did work on a big case uh, at the juvenile detention center in LA so you know for example they had you know a certain set of um, uh, rules and processes for grievances but the important thing is that um, the courts, uh, the, the rules around the Prison um, Litigation Reform Act that I mentioned earlier are so strict and the Supreme Court, um, you know, as recently as 2017, you know, once again reiterated, you know, there's very little exception to those rules. Um, the courts have been kind of split around the United States as to whether or not um, uh, claims of, of disability discrimination are included in the grievance process. But, um, you know, I think just a, a sort of an abundance of caution should file grievances for those things when you don't, when the kid isn't getting the um, accommodations. Um, and, uh, you know, it also is important to know that parents who have disabilities who need ac accommodations in order to be able to participate in any of the programs, there may be like family programs, fair, you know, family services that come out of detention and which I'm, you know, usually there is. Um, but if a parent because of their disability needs accommodations, 
they too can request reasonable accommodations. And um, if they don't get them, that's different. There's not, they're not prisoners for the purposes of the Prison Litigation Reform Act, and therefore, you know, um, don't need to go through a grievance procedure in order to have their rights um, addressed. But it's complicated um, and it's very unfortunate law. Um, I wish it didn't exist, but it does. Um, and, but the good news is that, you know, we can help walk people through it and explain. Yeah, I did remember my follow-up on the, on the PPT. <laughs> Since the child has to file a grievance, I assume, but the, par the parents or guardians are still in charge of the PPT? Yeah, so um, so the the chill so the, it, and the grievance can be not just about education. It could be any condition of care right. in the right. facility. But um, it doesn't change a parent or guardian's rights um, at the PPT at all. It, it's just the grievance procedure, and the grievance procedure is all about where you feel like your rights have have been violated. Doesn't. I guess I would say this, that also doesn't change the, there is still a right to due process and all the special education rights don't get taken away. Um, it just has to do with the conditions of care. Um, and like if there aren't accommodations so that let's say the kid could go to a sports activity in that the, you know, is happening at detention or they're being segregated unnecessarily. There, uh, for a good example is there's a case, this is adult prisoners, but there's a case in California where prisoners who were blind were being told they had to eat in a separate area um, than other prisoners. And that just was unnecessary segregation of kids, of, of uh, prisoners with, a, with disabilities. That's just an example. Thank you. Sure. Um, at this time, I wanna give Jen enough time to have yeah. her presentation. So I wanna thank um, Maria and Debbie and Mike for coming and sharing their information. I um, invite everybody to look into the chat as uh, I know that Maria put a couple of interesting things in there. And when I get that um, PowerPoint, I'll be happy to share it with everybody. But thank you so much for, for coming and providing us with this wonderful information. Yes. Well, thank you so much for having us. And, um, you know, we look forward to getting to work with you guys again in the future soon. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you nice everybody. meeting you guys. Nice yeah. to meet you. Bye. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to introduce attorney Jennifer Laviano. Jennifer is a special education attorney in Connecticut. She will be covering the link between school arrests and special education and the inappropriate, excuse me, use of school resource officers and positive versus punitive approaches to disciplining. Um, go ahead, Jen, take it away. Yes, and just before I get started, I did want to correct one thing that Deborah said on independent evaluations being funded by school districts if you're eligible for free lunch. In Connecticut, that's not the case. We have pushed for that legislation in Connecticut um, that you would be automatically entitled to an independent evaluation if your child is on free lunch, but so far we haven't accomplished that. But it is on our agenda and we are aware of it. I just want to make sure people were aware of that. If you have questions, additional questions about independent evaluations, I'll, I'll be happy to address them during Q&A. Um, and just to introduce myself a little bit and to apologize in advance, I speak really quickly, but I'm very happy to um, follow up at the end with any questions that you may have lingering. And I will try to keep it a little bit slower because I know sometimes I, I can get very animated. Um, a few things, I'm actually a second generation special education attorney, my late father was a civil rights lawyer, and then he suckered me into going to law school and um, getting involved in his special education aspect of his practice. He passed away almost 20 years ago, but I am going on 25 years of special education litigation. I attend IEP meetings, uh, 504 meetings, due process, mediation, and that's what I do. It's exclusively what I do is special education law. So um, I wanna do a little bit of an overview of the special education laws and then talk about how they intersect on this issue of discipline and school arrests because it's a very hot topic. It's one that those of us in the advocacy community in Connecticut and nationally are highly concerned about and for good reason. So um, the federal law that governs special education is called the IDEA. It was on one of the slides that Deborah presented, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. That is federal law. 
but much like you were uh, expressing some questions and concerns during the previous presentation, just like different facilities have slightly different rules, different states have slightly different rules and they're permitted to do so as long as they follow the federal law. And even within a state, I can tell you this is PPT season and how one district does something versus another, even though we have a uniform IEP form um, is can be can vary dramatically. So you do sort of have to know what who you're dealing with in addition to what the federal law requires. Uh, the most important thing that the federal law requires, and again, that does apply to incarcerated students as well, is that each year a child who's determined to be eligible for special education and related services is offered what we call FAPE. FAPE is a free and appropriate public education. Free meaning at no cost to the parent, Appropriate is really the, the big million dollar question about whether that what they've offered is appropriate, if you believe it's appropriate versus whether the school believes it's appropriate and whether a hearing officer would believe it's appropriate. Uh, public means publicly funded. It can mean a private placement at a state approved special education school, or it can mean publicly funded contribution towards another kind of program if there's a legal dispute. And education is more than just academics. It includes social skills, um, adaptive skills, functional skills, uh, things of that nature, which is something that schools sometimes forget. Um, and so when we talk about students who are eligible for special education services, the law is quite clear that you're not, school districts are not permitted to attach certain services to certain labels, okay? So there are many federal labels of, of what the, the category could be of disability. And then in Connecticut, we have a few additional ones and some that are a little fine tuned. So as an example, the federal definition of specific learning disability is simply specific learning disability. In Connecticut, we have the option of a specific learning disability or specific learning disability slash dyslexia. We also have a fine tune other health impaired slash ADD. Um, there, you know, so there are lots of categories and just having a diagnosis doesn't mean you're eligible for an IEP. All right. So you may be eligible for, for a 504 plan. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act was referenced earlier in regard to discrimination, but in addition to the anti-discrimination and retaliation provisions, Section 504 requires any entity that receives public funding, which is all public schools, to um, not discriminate against somebody and to provide them a reasonable accommodations if they need them in order to access their education. So it applies to public libraries, but certainly to schools. Um, and it's interesting because sometimes students who are subject to discipline only have a 504 plan, not yet an IEP. And then the question comes up, and I'm going to talk about discipline in a bit, as to whether they're eligible for the same protections that students who have IEPs are eligible for in terms of discipline, and they are, and I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. Um, so when you look at the statute, there's the substantive requirement to receive an appropriate public education every year, and then there are the procedural safeguards. The procedural safeguards are things like the school district has to convene the IEP meeting at least once a year. The school district has to give you written notice of the invitation to the meeting and who's going to be there. They have to include the parent or at least try to include the parent in the meeting. There are certain people who have to be part of that IEP team meeting. So those are the procedures. They um, are violated frequently, whether that violation means that your child was deprived an appropriate program is a question of fact and law for a hearing officer um, to, in a due process hearing or ultimately a judge if necessary to determine. Um, and it really does come down to whether that violation resulted in a deprivation of actual education. Um, so that's a really quick overview of a very complicated statute that's been around and interpreted for decades now. Um, so the students, any student who has an IEP may end up in a situation where they are being um, disciplined or arrested in school. And certainly students who don't have disabilities and students who are suspected of having disabilities and should have been identified, okay? So anyone can be subjected to discipline in, or arrest in our schools. What we do know is the um, commissioner, then commissioner Cardona, who is now the secretary of education for the United States, um, has presented some, some alarming information about the data that's been collected in Connecticut about uh, in-school arrests and discipline. So while the suspension rates for the general population of students is about 6.7% 
for students with disabilities, it's over 11%. So that's very alarming. It's almost twice the rate, if you, know, if you think about it. Uh, we know that students with disabilities are disciplined more frequently across the board, not just with suspensions. And um, having uh, school resource officers in your school actually increases your chance of being arrested in school, whether you have a disability or not, statistically significantly so. Um, and so we are very focused in Connecticut, those of us who are in the advocacy community, and I'm going to talk to you about an organization that I think you should be aware of in making sure that this changes, because what frequently happens is students with disabilities, especially students who have autism spectrum disorders, attention deficit disorders, and um, um, what we call an emotional disturbance under the federal law, are restrained and secluded. And we know that throughout the country, students with disabilities sometimes die in our public schools because of improper uh, attempts to restrain and exclude students when their behavior is outside of the control of the educators. So these are high stakes and very, very important. And also important um, and juxtaposed with the previous presenters is that we know that students with disabilities are entitled to what we call the least restrictive educational environment, LRE. Um, and that is because when the statute was passed, students with disabilities did not even have a legal right federally to go to school at all. And so it was fundamentally to get students with disabilities to stop being discriminated against and to be able to go to their local public school just like their neighbors. And so to that extent, we want to make sure that you're receiving a program that's as similar to what you would receive if you didn't have an, a disability. Um, but that least restrictive environment provision loses a lot of credibility when we're talking about incarcerating students. So I'm frequently saying to school districts when I'm trying to get more support for my clients in the district, and they'll sometimes say, well, if we provide that outside support or pull the child for that or place in a therapeutic school, then we're violating the least restrictive environment provisions. And I'm often saying, well, it's better than what we're concerned will happen if this doesn't get under control, which is incarceration, nothing more restrictive than that, right? So um, all of these things are, are considerations that we have to make. Um, what is important to know is that once a child is identified for an IEP so that they're determined eligible for special education services, if the school wishes to suspend the student for more than 10 consecutive school days, okay, so 10 consecutive school days, then the federal law requires that a manifestation determination is held. That is an IEP team meeting in Connecticut, we call them PPTs, where the team gets together and determines whether or not the alleged misconduct was or was not a manifestation of the child's disability. Why? Because we obviously don't want to punish students for conduct that was not within their control, okay? It's a very simple way of uh, analyzing a rather complex process. And um, it, it, there are exceptions, even if it was a manifestation of the child's disability, because once you determine whether or not it was a manifestation, it limits the school's ability to move forward with, say, an expulsion hearing um, or to, to remove the child for more than 10, day, 10 consecutive days. Little caveat there, there are cases that say if a student is repeatedly being suspended for two days here, three days there, two days there, three days here, that that is tantamount to a de, what we call de, de, de facto, um, meaning by fact, you're really essentially suspending the student because they're missing so much school, right? Or you're expelling them at a certain point. So you could ask for a manifestation determination PPT if that's happening to your child, repeated suspensions, even if they don't go beyond 10 consecutive days. Um, but certainly when the school wants to remove the child for more than 10 consecutive days, they have to have that manifestation determination. A manifestation determination is also required for 504 students and also for students who are suspected of having a disability. So if your child gets into serious disciplinary trouble at school and doesn't have an IEP and has never been evaluated for an IEP, and you suspect that the reason that they're um, engaged in this misconduct is a disability, you actually have the right to a manifestation determination because your child is a child who's, who is suspected of having a disability. And what would happen at that meeting would in all likelihood be, if the school's following the procedures, that they are required to now evaluate your child in all suspected areas of disability. That requirement that a school district evaluate children who are suspected of having disabilities who reside within their school district, even if they don't attend the public schools, is an ongoing affirmative obligation on the school 
throughout the time the child resides in that district, whether they've been referred for an IEP or not. So many of my cases are what are called child find violations, meaning that there were numerous red flags throughout the child's education and sometimes ongoing efforts by the parent to beg for help, um, that the parents were concerned about the child's behavior or performance in school. And they are either ignored or repeatedly told everything's fine, or we don't see that here, or any number of variants of, of there's, not a, there's nothing to worry about. Um, the school is required before they do that to um, fully evaluate the child though. They're required by law to do that um, in all suspected areas of disability. While we're talking about evaluations, and since it came up earlier, the, the law on independent educational evaluations, which is where the school evaluates your child and you don't agree with some or all of the testing, and you ask for them to pay for somebody outside of the school to evaluate your child, which is, in my view, the most important procedural protection a parent has under the law is that right to a second opinion at public expense because whether they're the world's greatest school psychologist or not, school district employees have a vested interest in the outcome of the recommendations because ultimately they are or are not recommending something that their boss has to pay for or provide. And they may be not realizing that, but it is inherently a conflict on some level. And so you're entitled to this outside opinion by somebody that you select um, and paid for by the school district. The law on it is really complicated and it is highly resisted by most school districts. In fact, most chair people of um, PPTs routinely say no, even without giving it much thought because they've been told to do so by the director of special education. Sometimes they'll say yes, but it's usually a no. Um, and if they say no, they're required by law, the school district is required by law to file a due process hearing defending their own evaluation without delay. So they can't just say no and just walk away. Um, they actually have to go to the state and say, assign a hearing officer to us so we can prove that what we have done is accurate and, and uh, an appropriate evaluation. That also is frequently violated. Um, parents will call me and say, they said no a year ago and I haven't heard anything from them since then. That's really not lawful. Um, if they say yes at the PPT meeting to the independent evaluation, you as a parent get to select who does it, as long as that person meets the district's criteria for if they were gonna get their own outside evaluation. Um, and it's very important because uh, frequently parents have real concerns that the school either doesn't see or is downplaying. Um, and by the time somebody calls someone like me, it's a crisis because it's been, you know, sometimes months or years of um, either performance or behavior that has, has been concerning without the proper evaluation. So, um, Thankfully, uh, where we are now is that um, the schools in Connecticut and nationally are really moving towards a model of approaching discipline and behavior from a much more uh, appropriate and um, compassionate uh, viewpoint. The term social emotional learning, SEL, is a hot term right now in education. And virtually every committee um, at the legislature that has education connected to it is looking into it. There's a whole committee on it. Um, and Yale has done a tremendous amount of work on incorporating social emotional learning into schools. Uh, it is important because we are hoping that educators become more trauma informed um, inter interventionists. Uh, one of the big concerns that we have, and I should just tell you about the organization I'm referring to when I see we now, um, Seek Special Education Equity for Kids is an organization that was started uh, about four or five years ago. I'm, I'm on the board and it is all about legislating, educating and advocating for students with disabilities in Connecticut. Um, the, or, the website is seekct.com. Uh, SEEK has been very involved. We have a lobbyist. All the, of the money we raise goes to that lobbyist. The first legislation we passed was that teachers and educators should not be retaliated against for being honest at a PPT meeting about what a child requires, because we've all been in those meetings where you see the person who's looking down and is embarrassed because they, they know the child needs something else and they don't want to say it for fear of retribution. Um, it's an excellent organization and we do a lot of outreach and, um, and advocacy. And we are highly concerned about the use of, of school resource officers in Connecticut. We were part of helping to try to get some legislation passed that unfortunately did not yet pass, but who knows, we'll keep at it 
to um, instead of having the this, this school district spending money on SROs, they should be spending that money on social workers. There are many, many schools in Connecticut that don't have a social worker. And what I see, and I've seen this more times than I can count, are students who have behaviors due to their disability and the teacher's go-to is to call the SRO down to the classroom. I had one client who was escorted by a uniformed, a, a young child with autism, escorted out of his classroom so many times by the uniformed SRO that he was having nightmares that he was gonna get arrested. It's, it's become the go-to. It's too easy to just call the SRO down rather than address the behavior with a specialist. Um, sometimes an expensive specialist, but one that the school district is required to bring in if it's necessary. So SEEK has been working very hard and working with Chris, Senator Chris Murphy nationally to try to make sure that we are addressing um, the improper use in our view of um, officers and, and um, police in our schools. Uh, we feel it's a recipe for disaster and it has been for quite some time. And our focus really should be on addressing the underlying behavior and providing what the law requires, which is positive behavioral supports in our schools. Um, SEEK does a Thursday night, not every week, even though it's called SEEK this week, Facebook live um, program, uh, different topics each time we do it. Tomorrow night at seven on Facebook, um, the topic is actually functional behavioral assessments and behavior plans uh, with two board certified behavior analysts presenting on that. So that'll be seven o'clock tomorrow night on Facebook um, on the SEEK um, page. And so um, at any rate, so these are all very important considerations when you're looking at um, a child's IEP. If your child's IEP does not include appropriate behavioral support, that in and of itself could be determined to be a deprivation of a free and appropriate public education. So what do you do if your child isn't receiving an appropriate program and or behavior, behavior is clearly impeding their access to the educational environment? Obviously you wanna ask for that independent evaluation. That's a, a big thing. You could ask for mediation. Um, the, the mediation system in Connecticut is quite good. It is not so in some other states from my colleagues, what they tell me, but in Connecticut, we actually have independent contractors paid for by the state who are trained in these cases. And they now are doing them like this. We do them virtually um, where the parents can participate from home and um, the school district participates. And then the mediator sort of has two different rooms. So you're not all together like this. Um, with the, with the school district, the mediator goes back and forth from two virtual rooms to try to see if you, they can come to an agreement. And, um, and that's a very, it's a free, very helpful process for some families. The caveat I will give to, to parents on that is that most school districts do them all the time and they have a lawyer at the other end of a phone call if they need to, to do that. And you probably will be asked to sign something if you participate in mediation and it might include a waiver of some legal claims. So I would just be cautious if I were to do that that you do that going in with the hope that maybe you either have consulted with somebody or that you at least know that you may be asked to review a, a contract. Um, but it is a good and very effective system in Connecticut and some school districts will just revise the IEP rather than have the parent enter into a contract with them. Uh, you could also file for a due process hearing. Again, that's one of those things where some parents have been successful doing so on their own, but um, it is daunting even when you have counsel and statistically in Connecticut, pro se parents, meaning parents who are not represented by an attorney, lose more than 90% of the time. So, uh, because the school district still brings in their lawyer. So it's it's not something I think you wanna do, undertake lightly. You don't wanna undertake it lightly, even if you do have a lawyer, it's a really risky process and expensive and um, time consuming and upsetting. Uh, the other thing you can do is file a state complaint. Um, the Office of Civil Rights, which is the federal office that was referenced in an earlier slide by the other presenters, is also an avenue to pursue if you believe there's some kind of discrimination occurring uh, based on disability. But you can file complaints with the state that are different from a due process hearing request um, if it's a discrete issue like the IEP isn't being implemented. Like you, you agree with the document, but they're not doing it. Um, or uh, although unless it's clear cut, like the speech pathologist has been out all year and he ha your child hasn't received the services. If it's just a question of whether you think they're doing it well, a complaint may not be the right way to go. Our complaint process in Connecticut is, um, you know, you file the complaint and then the state contacts the school district and says, this is the complaint we received, please respond to it. And then the state um, investigator will issue uh, findings and recommendations and corrective action if it's necessary. It, you have to 
have a pretty compelling case in my view for that to make sense because you don't get witnesses, you don't get you know exhibits and all the things that you get in a hearing. You just sort of tell them what you think happened and then they often, I hate to say they often will take the school district at their word that, that things happened a certain way even if you don't really believe that's the way it, it occurred. So those are all um, important ways that you can go about disagreeing with your school district if you feel that the um, program that your child's receiving is not appropriate. I'm trying to go through my list here. Um, so in terms of legislation, I would say if you join SEEK, which is free to parents, if you join SEEK as a member, you'll get action alerts about when you might need to contact your legislator about some um, something that impacts children with disabilities, either uh, nationally or in Connecticut. And um, again, the, the Facebook uh, SEEK these weeks ha have been very popular and helpful. We started them just in response to the pandemic because nobody knew what the state was gonna do and what they were telling districts to do in terms of whether to hold PPTs or not, or comply with IEPs or not. And uh, because they were really helpful to people, we've been trying to keep them up as frequently as we can. So um, the national organization that you might wanna be aware of is COPA. COPA is C-O-P-A-A dot org. It stands for the Council of Parent Attorneys and Advocates. And while um, the organization is sort of like a trade organization for people who are professional advocates or attorneys in this field, parents are, are welcome to join. And we have discounted rates for military families as well. What mo most parents really enjoy other than the conference, which this year was virtual, next year is um, planned to be in Boston, so not too far, um, but we will probably op offer some virtual aspects to it as well because it was so popular, but there's listservs on there as well. And that can be very, very helpful just in terms of asking questions um, and trying to inform yourself about what your child's rights are and what your rights are in this process. So um, that's an overview um, of the, the statute and the ways in which uh, school arrests and um, discipline intersect. It's all rather complicated and very daunting for parents to begin to understand their rights, which we fully understand. Um, uh, but uh, at the same time, you're here, which is a big start. You know, you're trying to learn more about it. So I see there are some questions, although I didn't open the chat, but I wanted to, I almost always end up where I'm asked so many questions that I run way over. So I wanted to give time to make sure that I could answer. Well, them. I think that there's just so uh, enough people here. If somebody would like to unmute and just ask their question, it can sure. work that way. So if anyone has a question, go ahead. Anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Okay, well, I have one. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you find that there's a disproportionately um, uh, difference in the rate according to the level of disability? So for example, I was reading about um, one part of Connecticut where children with severe autism, for example, um, were often the ones who were called on to have them have not, I wouldn't say arrest so much, but the use of, of uh, handcuffs or taking them in with away with the police or ambulances or things along that nature more often than not than children with lesser degrees. So I'm not aware of any data that's been collected on either disability uh, category or severity of disability within mm -hmm. that category. Although, as I know, you know, Crystal, that's such a, you know, high functioning versus low functioning is such a, a mixed mm -hmm. term because, you know, for, it's really so, it's so different how it impacts an individual um, and, and the challenges it presents. What I'll tell you anecdotally from my practice is that it, it really, I, I find that actually many of my clients who are who have those invisible disabilities, where um, where you know the the educators assume that the student isn't struggling with something, but in fact they really really are. Um, not picking up on social cues, as an example, not understanding or reading body language, language processing issues, impulsivity and attention, all of those things that you know the person who's who's arresting the student might not necessarily recognize that this is a disability are the ones who get into the most trouble. Um, but that may be a function of the fact that. That it's, it's just my practice that, you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't have the science behind it. I've, it, it's, we know from national 
data that students of all types of disabilities are disciplined and arrested more frequently than their non-disabled peers, which is so ironic because we also know from other studies that individuals with disabilities in general are far more likely to be the victims of crime than the perpetrators of crimes. And yet we have this, just as with, we do with bullying. So when you look at the bullying data in Connecticut, certainly, and I would imagine nationally, although I'm not aware of any study on it, you know, you would assume that the number of students who have disabilities uh, who are bullied is commensurate with the population of students with disabilities. And it's something like three to four times that. So like a third of all bullying referrals that go up to the state um, or complaints are students with disabilities, even though they only represent about 10 to 12% of our population. So, you know, we know that that our population of students are much more vulnerable and susceptible to mistreatment across the board. And then when you get into restraint and seclusion, which we have pretty good relative to the rest of the country. We have pretty good restraint and seclusion laws on the books in Connecticut that keep school districts accountable um, far, far more than some other states. There has been a national push to get federal restraint and seclusion legislation passed, um, but we do have state restraint and seclusion le uh, legislation and policies and procedures. It's still really shameful how many very, very young students are being restrained in their public schools. I mean, yeah, I, I'm so, and I, I don't don't envy the job of educators, especially these days. It's a really, really, really hard job. And I, I get it that they're often not given the training or support they need in their classrooms. But at the same time, one wonders if you can't control, you know, a 40 year old, I mean, sort of 40 pound kindergartner without restraining them, that's really a problem. And it, it's traumatic. We are crea creating trauma for many of our students who already have underlying disabilities because of the restraint that's going on far too frequently in our private schools too. Yeah. Yeah, and I know as a parent, obviously it was more as my son was aging. Um, I, I think that I felt like that I was, I don't wanna use the word forced, but um, conditioned to think that restraint and seclusion were acceptable means due to the size and the nature of my son's behavior. So how would you recommend to other families to be able to investigate and understand that that does not have to be like the first go-to? Because in my mind, I am saying to myself, you know, my son is six foot tall. I mean, at 17 years old, uh, he was six foot tall and he was very physical and, you know, but so I'm thinking, you know, okay, maybe they're right. So how would you... It's a really good question, Crystal. And I will say that this topic, even, even among the community of advocates for children with disabilities is controversial because there are many parents who, when this comes up at their state or, or the federal legislature come in and say, if it weren't for restraint, my child would be dead. I, you know, thank God his team is able to implement these strategies because he runs into the road or, you know, or he hits his head a hundred times or whatever it is, self injurious behaviors. And I'm not a behaviorist by any means, which is why mm -hmm. I think it's so important that school districts bring in you know, really highly trained highly individuals trained individual. to consult to them when the, when a student's behavior reaches that level. But it's clear in Connecticut, it's supposed to be a last resort. And that if it's happening, we're supposed to be convening the PPT to find out what's going on in the program or not going on in the program that's contributing to the behavior. And it's clear under federal law that positive behavioral supports have to be in place. Uh, what I would say is if your child is frequently being restrained or secluded, you should be asking for a PPT meeting to address the program because something's not right. And a, an FBA should be done at that point. An FBA is a functional behavioral assessment. And that presumably is supposed to be done in a way that we figure out what the antecedent to the behavior was and what the function of the behavior is so that we know what's happening with the, with the student. And then uh, assume uh, that we address it through a behavior intervention plan that is uh, done with the parents. And so ultimately, you know, these are all PPT considerations as to whether behavior is impeding the child's education. But I, I would just say some of it is a mindset change, Crystal. Some of it is not just signing the thing at the beginning of the meeting and just saying, okay. And, and you know, um, a colleague of mine has a saying that I love, which is sometimes to change other people's behavior, you have to change your own. And if every single time you are notified that there was a restraint or a seclusion, you send a follow-up email or you call and you insist on having a meeting, they might be a little bit more reluctant to make that the go-to strategy because you're going to become a pain in their butt. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that that kind of micromanaging is necessary, I hate to say. Um, other questions? 
Oh, I have a question from someone who asks, what about when the behavior is seen as an endangerment to others and that that is their excuse for restraint? Yeah, so and and under the statute, you know, of course, they schools are, are entitled to make sure that they have a safe environment for other students. Um, but again, they had there has to be a demonstration that that is actually the fact. So one of the exceptions to the um, when you have the manifestation determination and the school can still go ahead and remove your child, even if it is a manifestation, is if the student has uh, has um, committed bodily harm, and that's defined by the penal penal code. It's not just you know I hurt somebody. You have to have actually really injured somebody. They can still remove your child, even if it's a manifestation of the uh, of the child's disability. The protections for students with disabilities were a lot stronger prior to 1997. That's that revision of the statute sort of removed a lot of the protections um, and made it tougher to um, keep your child in school or keep your child in the mainstream if they were engaging in significantly da dangerous or worrisome behavior. Um, what I will say is that it does have to actually though be a danger. You know, they can say it, but I mean, I, I came across a case, it wasn't a Connecticut case once when I was researching disciplinary issues for a brief that a school district once tried to remove a child from a classroom because they claimed that he was brandishing a weapon and the weapon was a paper clip. <laughs> I mean, it's just, so you have to like actually be able to say that, so, and they are required by state law to document what happened. And, you know, so I would say you wanna, you have an entitlement as a parent to your child's educational records. So you have a right to ask at any time under FERPA, F-E-R-P-A, um, which is sort of like the educational version of HIPAA is the best, you know, every time you go to the doctor's office, you have to sign that HIPAA form. FERPA says that you have a right as a parent to a copy of all of your child's educational records. And you can write to the school and say, under FERPA, I want a copy of all of my child's educational records. By doing that, you may find internal communications or documentation that you didn't know existed of incidents that occurred. You are entitled to a free copy, but if you get if you ask for it more than once, anything that's a duplicate, they have a right to charge you for. Um, and so I tell parents, and that usually gets the school's attention. If you send in a FERPA request, they they know you're you're up to something and that you're starting to advocate. For the child. Is that the Sunshine Law thing? Yeah, yes, that's the federal. With it's sort of the, it's Sunshine Law. FERPA is is child specific, okay? So you're asking for your child's record. records. The Sunshine Laws are FOIA, which is the Freedom of Information Act. Those are really the Sunshine Laws. That's somewhat different. That's that's not just for your child, And but you could use FOIA. I've used FOIA for certain situations like um, the school district is bringing in a new behavioral um, consultant and the parent is unhappy because they thought the old agency was good and the school district has a contract now with this new agency under FOIA I can ask for the contract between the school district and the new agency and find out how much they're spending and ask for the old contract and find out if it's motivated by money it helps down the road if you're having a hearing to prove that that agency is biased I got one contract that showed that the agency was charging that school district alone like eight hundred thousand dollars a year and I'm thinking you know it's going to be hard to think that that witness isn't biased if they're getting eight hundred thousand dollars from the, from the school district. So you can use FOIA, but in terms of your individual child's records, you really want to use FERPA. Thank you for that clarification. No problem. Um, I have another question. I don't know. She may want to unmute because um, I'm not sure which it relates to, but she um, asks, when all schools, including, I guess, school requests, including outplacement are refused for an autism student, a student with autism, what should you do for the student? I don't know if the person asking the questions wants to unmute and clarify. Oh, uh, my question is, uh, the students already have autism diagnosis. The IEP requirement had a BCBA involved, but the district doesn't provide the BCBA involved to the, to the program. So the program is failed. Then district say that, they don't let the child in the public school, even outplacement don't want to accept the student in their classroom. So what the student can go? For my understanding is this should have to build in the program, unique program in, uh, only for the student needs for the IEP goal. But the district just don't give the student any service, anything that she stay home. So, not into school, any school, any program. 
they, they can't do that. Um, they can't lawfully do that. They can try to do it, but it's a, it's a violation of the law for a few reasons. Uh, first, if the first if the IEP calls for a board certified behavior analyst and they're not doing it, they're in violation of of the IEP. The IEP operates like a contract, so they they're not implementing the IEP, so they're out of compliance with the IEP. That's that in and of itself is a violation. If a school district feels they can't meet their ch a child's needs in their program and they recommend outplacement, a parent has a right to say I disagree with that, and if they file for a hearing and invoke stay put, which is a procedural protection, the school cannot remove the child from the public school program. They have to maintain that placement, but it does require you to file for a hearing in order to, to assert that protection. Um, however, uh, if it's a, a matter where the manifestation determination was made and a, an exception is found, they still can remove the child from the public school, but they must provide a program. They can't just remove you and do nothing. They still have to offer you free and appropriate public education. So um, if none of the outplacements will accept the student and the school district, still the school district can't just close the doors of public school and say, we're not doing anything. If the child has an IEP, they're required to offer a, a program. Um, they're absolutely required to offer an offer a program. So I would think that would be a good time to either um, file a complaint or um, you know contact. Sometimes if you Connecticut's a small state, and our State Department of Education can be very helpful. They sometimes I disagree vehemently with them, but they can be very helpful. If you call the state and say my child has an IEP, they won't let him in school. You know, believe me, they're going to pay attention to that. Um. But I just see that does doesn't mean all the connect uh, connect uh, the older school, including outplacement, can refuse the child enroll their school. Outplacements can refuse admission oh. to a child. They can say we don't think that we can meet their needs, but the public okay. schools have to provide an alternative. Then, yeah, does the public school have to provide a, a, a appropriate the program only they for the child? They cannot uh, put the child without the no service. No, nope, they can't. They're no service. Right. But the state state education <coughs> department is involved, but uh, I don't know what's going on. They say that's not appropriate, but the family doesn't prepare any service for the child. Uh, you know, so every case has a lot has a lot of detail that I don't know just from answering a question in a, yes, in a presentation, yes. but they can't just not offer a program that's not permitted. But uh, in 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 the ending, they this children can call DCF to take the child over, over. Well, they can refer to DCF if they think that the child's being kept home as opposed to not, you know, I mean, some parents just say, I'm not sending my child and that ultimately can result in educational ne neglect uh, referral. But if the school's not offering any program to the child and that's why the child's home, then um, we actually recently have a, because school districts are what are called mandated reporters. That means they are required to notify the DCF if they suspect a disability or abuse or neglect but it is sometimes abused by schools where they'll refer DCF with, with um, improper reasons, you know, to, to, for, to either intimidate the parent or to avoid acknowledging their own uh, obligation to the child. And there actually is a recent case in Connecticut that says that doing, uh, referring a family uh, maliciously, you can, you can sue the school for that. You can, you can sue the individuals for that too. Yeah, um, that's I have a little bit of confusing is uh, we did a mediation agreement to go one school. So did uh, finally accept the child in this program, but the mediation said that we have we can provide five hour BCBA in involved if food the student have a behavior issue, they cannot result. So you know outplacement have a 14 five day program, right? So if they cannot uh, moving forward, they need to let the BCB involve this program. After the this BC, if we involve the five hour BCBA, the time, if we still cannot resolve the problem, they can, we can sit down back to PPT, right? <laughs> For my understanding. 
Well, if they signed a mediation agreement agreeing to five yes. hours of a BCBA and, and, they, yes. and you signed it in a mediation, that's yes. actually enforceable in federal court. The statute says that if you come to a mediation agreement, you don't have to go through a due process hearing. You can just go right to a federal judge and say they didn't follow the mediation agreement. Now, that's a, quite an undertaking, but they are required to follow mediation agreements by law. Yeah, because they don't, they let the DCF talk over parents' right. They say that you cannot go mediation because they don't have parental right. <laughs> That's, That's easy. Like a very <laughs> complicated situation. Yes, yeah, very, it. yes, very, very sad case for Connecticut in there. So I just saw the all the laws say the parents have a right to see, including, including, right, for non not uh, the ability to teach student. Parents have a right to pick up the school. Parents have a right to go out placement or not out placement. But in this case, they say that, okay, you have a lawyer, you have things, but we take your rights. So you cannot go to process because I think the school placement, we can through the education court, right? Let's special education lawyer to deal each other. Is not, but the, there was no reason to take the child away. They're confused. <laughs> confused. So what yeah. court I can continue to do to, to for the case? <laughs> well, sometimes parents do waive their rights in a settlement with a school district where it, it, where the the school agrees to do certain things, or they agree to place their ch the child in a private placement and pay for it. But in exchange, the parents won't bring due process during the time that the, the agreement is in place. So that does happen. Um, but if assuming that that's not the case, they can't just shut the door to, to education. They have to provide something. Yeah, the only reason is they don't want the parents involved. Too noisy. If a parents go away, see, nobody compare for IEP go. Nobody compare, say the IEP go never must in their 10 years never change. <laughs> My child- I see that a lot too, I hate to say. The, the goals that never change, right? Yes. They, my child let go for, can forward the four step. The speech pathology goes stay in the two step. Two step here in the printing school, let it He's that's, a high- that's not progress. <laughs> <laughs> but the child doesn't follow the route to showing he, he able to do this. Doesn't yeah. mean child not able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that that's they say that okay your parents are too noisy <laughs> no parents is easy everybody yeah, they, they, they tend they, to not like parents who who advocate um for the mm -hmm. for their child if they're not doing the right thing but some schools will really welcome it i i'm jaded because i'm brought in when there is a problem but you know ultimately there are many many districts who, who do their best and who welcome parents to participate in the process but there's always the the bad eggs for sure and um, or what we call repeat offenders that we have a school district. So, unfortunately, any yeah. other are there do any other questions? Any... Oh, I'm sorry, Joanne. I just say that do you have any advice? I can watch court. I can go. <laughs> I, I didn't understand that question. No, for this kind of case, what placement I can uh, comply to go? <laughs> I don't know, you know, one of the things I should have said at the beginning, but I didn't is that, you know, I'm providing just sort of general information for you all, but my, it's not legal advice. I would have to look at the records. I would have to know a lot of information in order to tell you individually for your child what's appropriate, because I, I certainly don't know just from a few questions. <laughs> Thank you. So you are from dis disability rights? No, I'm not from Disability Rights. I'm in private practice, but Disability Rights Connecticut is a fantastic organization. They do a lot of good, good work. So you're a lawyer, right? I'm a lawyer, yes. Oh, okay. I can contact with you later. <laughs> you can feel free to call my office and they'll take they'll go through the intake. <laughs> <and Sorry. laughs> is there anybody else who has a question they want to ask before Jen goes? Pat, you had a couple comments I thought you might want to, did you want to share? No, I just put in in the chat if anyone wants to read it what my experience was when I tried to go to due process by myself without an attorney. It was um, it was not good. Not fun. <laughs> and uh, I didn't. Started. We ended up not. I mean, mostly I was not intimidated. I was okay with it, but trying to find information about how to go to due process and where to get 
you know, what the procedures are, how do I call a witness, how, you know, do they have to come if I call them from the school, that sort of thing. You know, none of that is out there. So, I mean, I was very lucky. I, I spoke to a couple of different attorneys. I don't remember if you were one of them, Jen. I don't um, <laughs> it, was, it was several, many years ago. Yeah. Um, I spoke to a couple of attorneys and as a consult, um, the attorneys didn't really want to take my case because I just wanted an IEE and they wanted to go further with it. And I'm like, no, I just want the IEE. That's yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense to spend the money on a lawyer <laughs> on an IEE case. You could just pay for the evaluation, right? But it's right, that's right. That's so they were they were, but I was kind of stuck in my. Well, I, I wanted the IEE. I could have right. paid for it myself, but I I was mad at the school. They didn't do what they had said they were going to do. I had it all re on recording, you know, and they're like, well, you know, it wasn't in the IEP notes. I'm like, no, but I have it recorded for the PPT that you agreed to certain right. testings and then you didn't do it. I mean, basically they tested my son who was 17 at the time for autism. They did the ADOS test and I'm like. No time like the present. <laughs> well, I mean, there's, he's, he'd been on an IEP since he was three years old. He wow. went to birth to three, you know, he said, he, there's never been a question that he had autism. I'm like, that's not the test he needs. <laughs> but it was, it was all this stuff with a student. There was a student psychology student or whatever doing the testing and uh, so I was I was not happy with the way it turned out but basically what happened was after several months of trying to schedule I finally heard from the hearing officer and we had a call with the hearing officer and um the it was me the hearing officer and the board of ed attorney right and I just started asking all these questions that I had been trying to find all this information mm -hmm. out and I couldn't and um we were probably on the call for about two hours and they weren't happy about that. <laughs> I bet. The, the, those calls are supposed to be 20 minutes usually. Yeah. I was, well, I'm like, I have no place else to find, unless you can point to me where I can research this information and there's nothing. It's daunting so, even if you're a lawyer. I mean, yeah, it is. I have many clients whose, I, whose children I represent who are lawyers and they start trying to do it and then they say, there's no way I should do this. After all my annoying questions, the hearing officer said to the BOE attorney, have you tried to work things out? And the BOE attorney said, no, we haven't contacted her because she doesn't have an attorney. And I'm like, so I'm required to have an attorney? Who's paid me for that? <laughs> and yeah. uh, the hearing officer didn't care for that answer. So I heard from the school shortly after that and we worked things out, so. I bet I can guess which firm it was, but we're not, I'm not gonna do that in a public <laughs> <Yeah>. forum. <laughs> But I mean, they, they said, I mean, he just said, he says, why haven't you worked things out? I says, I haven't heard from the school since this started yeah. you know, for, about this issue since, since we went to due process, since they said no and went to due process and, um, and filed due process. And they said, and he says, well, you're supposed to have a meeting. And I'm like, nobody's contacted yeah. me. And the, and the attorney for the BOE said, no, it's, she doesn't have an attorney. So I didn't want to contact her. Hmm. <laughs> that kind of threw the hearing officer was not happy in the end more with them than me but um i mean i don't think he was happy with me either because i just <laughs> questions but uh yeah so there's just no place to get the information to go it's on hard. your own it's really hard yeah yes, it's very case specific there's a woman who wrote a really good book a colleague of mine in texas she practices in indiana too who wrote a really good guide but it's, you know, while some of it's applicable to Connecticut, it's not. Right, you need you something know? state specific. Yeah. And I, like I said, I'm, I'm a very good researcher. I was going on all these places. Yeah. I spoke to several attorneys um, as a consult. Um, and I mean, they helped me a lot, but there's nothing about the rules, you know, yeah. how to do a due process hearing, so. It's Sorry, incredibly but... interesting to me too, in one state, how different it can be, because we come from two different school districts with kids with two different issues and one of the school districts was completely accommodating straightforward just threw it on the table even if I didn't even know that it existed and then the other school district we had child find issues we had disagreeing with with um, evaluations I mean it, it's just unbelievable to me that just that variance of a 30 mile radius can be so different it's amazing i mean i this time of year in particular it's like you know and this year it's all virtual but but you know during usual ppt season i'm getting on the road and i'm driving to one place or the other 
And I walk into a team and it's sometimes it's like, you feel like they all read the same playbook because you're hearing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And other times you're like, why did this have to be so difficult? I, I just had the same issue 25 minutes ago and everyone would agree the child needs an evaluation. Why are you being, so, and you know, when parents call me, I, the first question we ask is where do you live? Because it's a small enough state that I know whether or not I'm gonna have an easy time or a medium kind of moderate time or it's gonna be a battle. And uh, unfortunately, you can usually tell which one it's going to be, even if it's in a town you haven't been in before, by which law firm represents them for special ed. I just put oh. in um, in the chat. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was I just, just going to the, tell that, so go ahead. Uh, I just put in the chat Jen's blog. I love your blog, Jen. It helped me through so many issues. I especially love things I've heard <laughs> parents <laughs> say or schools yeah. districts say. I think that's hilarious. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you enjoyed it. We also have a, a book and a podcast. So if you want it, the book is um, your special education rights, what your school district isn't te telling you, you could get that on Amazon. And our podcast is um, the special ed files, which is just sort of real stories and how, the, you know, how they, we, we change the names to protect the innocent and some of the facts, but it's, it's, we enjoy it. So thanks. Well, I'm glad thank you. you. Thank you so much My for pleasure. coming and for providing all the wonderful information. Just want to remind who's left. I know a lot of people have kind of fizzled out as time went by um, that there will be a recording uploaded that I will share. I'll be sending a follow up email with resources and also a link to a survey that hopefully everybody will fill out and if you have any further questions um, you can contact me at crystal at csacco at ctfsn.org or my lovely um, co-worker Laverne mm -hmm. at l-m-o-o-r-e -O -O -E at ctfsn.org and thank you Laverne for doing such thank heavy footwork you. for me and helping us put this thank together you. as well. Thanks, everyone, for Thank the support. Thank you, everybody. Thank very much. It. Bye -bye. Have a great day, rest of your day, everybody. Yes. Thank you, Thank you Bye. so much. Bye, Laverne. Bye, um, Crystal.